Well, hi, we're here with Elizabeth Barnes on Pushing the Limits, the show that gets into the minds of people who are at the limit of what humans can do. And Elizabeth Barnes is with me now from the UK. Good morning, Elizabeth. Good morning. <laughs> right, it's really, really nice to have you on the show. Now, Elizabeth uh, is a ultramarathon runner extraordinaire. She has recently won the infamous Marathon de Sables, which is a 240k race across the Moroccan Sahara. The very first um, ultra marathon that I did as well. I didn't win it. <laughs> Elizabeth is one of those elite athletes, and it's a real pleasure to have her on the show today. So thank you for joining us, Elizabeth. Now, tell us about that win. What was it like? Uh, wow, I mean, it was absolutely incredible. I um, I didn't expect it, um, and I just felt honoured to run alongside some really, really good athletes, and I actually couldn't believe what was happening, um, so I had to just pinch myself every day. <laughs> I was like, something's going to happen today, you know, or someone else is going to win today, or, and then I just kept winning every stage, and I was like, what's going on? Like, yeah, it was amazing. <laughs> <laughs> but you, you do have a long history of running. You've been running for many, many years, um, and you've done lots of marathons. But when did you get into ultramarathon running? So I started um, with ultramarathons in um, 2011, so I've done it for a few years. Um, I, yeah, yeah, I mean, I've been running on and off for uh, 20 plus years, I guess, and um, uh, did marathons, really enjoyed marathons, found that, you know, quite liked endurance running, and then... I think what happens to a lot of people, you know, you go like, okay, what can I do now? Well, I can run a marathon faster, or I can try and run further. And so um, I thought, well, I'm going to try and run, try and run a bit further, and, and I sort of really enjoyed it. Um, and I guess what what maybe led me onto that path was just a few life events. So my father passed away in 2010, like much too soon, very suddenly. Wow. Um, my mom's got Alzheimer. Um, my oh. husband actually got cancer. <laughs> oh my god! As well. uh, <laughs> so a lot of things happened, and I think um, um, you know it might be that for some people it might be other things, but those are yeah. the type of events that I think um, sort of helps you question what's important in life and maybe you know reprioritize things, and that's what I did basically. So work became less important, and things I wanted to achieve became more important, and so I, I think that's what led me onto the path. Yeah, I think that's um, it's a common thread amongst um, many ultra marathon runners that I talk to is that we are all, um, for the want of a better word, dealing with things. And um, yeah. running is a is a very cathartic um, pastime. Contrary to what people, you know, who don't run, um, you know, look at us crazies and think, well, what on earth could you ever get out of that sort of painful situation? But uh, you know, I do find that a lot of people find it very. Um, cleansing and very it just gives you that focus so when you're dealing with stuff um and you know you had a lot to deal with obviously um in a very short period of time it is a very uh cathartic sort of a a sport i find yeah and then i think once you get into it it's it's really interesting to to see how you can push your sort of mental barriers further and what you thought was impossible becomes possible and perfectly achievable and then I think you sort of continue to to do that and sort of thrive on those experiences. And yeah, I think that that's, um, yeah, you push out a little bit further and, and I mean like this past year for me I haven't been doing a lot of long distance running because I've had a couple of injuries and I've been changing my, my, my focus up into doing really short stuff and I've noticed that my horizons, my, you know, my normal go for a marathon on a Saturday type thing is now like, oh, I can't do that, you know, like it, it, it goes the other way too, I'll just warn you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there are different types of, of, of limits and you've got to keep pushing them all the time you know, to keep yeah. them out there, but once you have that experience, and when you have a little bit, it just gets a little bit more, because people think, oh, how am I going to get into ultra running, and it's just all so massive, but if you do just little bits, and then everything it slowly expands, you know, and it becomes, until you're running 240k across the Sahara, and you find yourself <laughs> in the middle of a massive race, but let's get back to Marathon the Sabres, because it is such yeah. a iconic 
um, event. I mean, for me, it was uh, you know it was the first ultra I did back in oh gosh when was it two thousand and two thousand and one I think, um, and it's now you know how many people are there were there like this year in the race? So there were about uh, thirteen hundred who wow. started. Yeah. And so I mean it was the thirtieth anniversary, so it was the biggest the biggest uh, field um, ever this year. And you won well. out of it's such a massive. Minutes. Field. That is a really impressive record then, you know. How many women were there? Um, so I think there were a couple of a couple of hundreds. Um, oh. I, I can't remember how many finished now, actually. Should have looked at the stats. <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, we don't need stats. <laughs> Roundabout. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's amazing. You know, when I was doing it back then, it was about 70 women and about 700 runners. And that sort of shows like the, the the popularity of the sport too over that period of time. How much it's just going, you know, growing to be such a massive international sport now, ultra marathon running. So, what was it like to actually, you know, for, for most people out there have no idea what it's like to to do something like this. How did you know? What was it like? What did it feel like for you? What were the highlights? So. Um... So, I mean, the first time I did the race was actually in 2012. So I had been there three years before. Um, and, and frankly, I don't think I would have won it had it not been for that, because I knew the race. Um, so um, I, I think you, I think it helps to understand the race, because it's so extreme. Um, I mean, for me, both times I had fantastic races, but the first time, you know, I didn't do near, near as well. Um, but it was a great race, but I didn't go there to win it, I went there to, to complete it. Yeah. Um, but it's just the, the enormous camaraderie, I think. Um, there are lots of other races, some people say, oh, you know, you don't have to go and do the Mountain de Sable, you can do another desert race, another Monte Stage race. And yes, of course you can, there are some fantastic races out there, but the Mountain de Sable is unique with that big field and the camaraderie that I think it, it creates and how everyone helps each other. And the fact that when you're running, you're always running um, with people all yeah. the time. You're never, you're never alone. Um, and it's just such a fantastic environment. You know, I think being out anywhere in sort of extreme kind of wilderness, you know, you just feel really privileged that you're actually able to be there, that you're able to, to run in that kind of environment. Um, yeah. So I always try to, you know, just look around me and actually, you know, appreciate that I'm lucky to be there. You know, Despite the pain. Yeah. <laughs> Despite the pain, you have to sometimes remind yourself, what the heck am I doing here? <laughs> Do you have any moments like that? Do you have times when, you, when you're feeling like, you know, in pain and desperate and, and, and thinking, how am I going to carry on? Or is it for you pretty, you know, I, I watched an interview with you with I Run Far and uh, you go, yeah, my feet are fine, yeah, my back's fine, you know, and I'm going... Oh, were you in the same sort of race that I did back then? Yeah, I, I, I do remember. I had um, um, I, I had a very painful a few hours after finishing the long stage. So the long stage was particularly long this year because I think they just wanted to make something special for the 30th anniversary. So we ran um, 92 kilometers, I think yeah. it was. Um, and I pushed, I pushed really hard, and and when I finished, I didn't realize how exhausted I was. But um, I think it took me about three, four minutes at the finish. You know, someone interviewed me. I had you know the mint tea, and then I walked a few steps, and I threw up twice. <laughs> I was like, oh, I must be tired. <laughs> and then there was, um, there was a storm, and so oh. my tent had collapsed. Um, and I just crawled in, you know, under it, and I was just in absolute agony for a few hours, sand everywhere, wind everywhere, and, you know, I tried to eat, and it was, you know, a spaghetti bolognese, mostly sand, and it was really oh, crunchy, yeah. and, so, uh, and, and then at that point, I, I sort of said to myself, why am I doing this, and, you know, I really shouldn't come back next year, um, but you forget, you know, and it's, it's part of it. Yeah, you do. You do forget the pain. Once once it's gone, it's gone, eh? It's like, yeah. And the memories and the stories remain. I had a very similar um, 
experience in the marathon, the Sables, the year, uh, the second year I did it, we had this massive uh, sandstorm, and I remember we had like this really big sand dune stage at the end of the yeah. long day, and it was just such a battle, and we came in and the whole tents were down on the ground too. Um, is it still the old coffee bean sacks and things, or have they, they modernised now with, with proper tents? I'm in, uh, no, it's, it's the same. Yeah. It's the same setup. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like for for the for I the listeners. It. Yeah, yeah. I think it's great. You know, it was just made out of coffee sacks, it's open at the front and the bank of course and when a, a sandstorm comes through the whole thing collapses and yeah, you're sort of lying on the ground with nothing to cover you and absolutely yeah. miserable. Um, but how do you how did you train for this? Let's get into your training a little bit. Um what sort of mileage have you been doing and what sort of a regime? You're also a, co- a running coach. What's your philosophies as far as training goes? What sort of school of thought do you belong to, if you like? You know, is it massive mileage? Is it is it strength training? Is it What do you do? Yeah, that's it's interesting. And, um, I mean, I, I don't think that there is kind of one approach that applies to, you know, ultra running as such because all the races are, are very different and um, certainly different approaches can work well as well for, you know, the, the same type of distance. But um, with the Mount on the Sable, my, my experience is that a lot of people who come in as novices, they go, oh, shift, I'm going to run 250 kilometers and then they start doing these massive miles and then um, and then they get injured. Um I think you have to look at this race and, and see what it's actually about, break it down in its component, and you realize that for most of the days you're running 30 kilometers to a marathon, and then you have one long day. And I think that's really important, because um, um, for me, that means that it's more like marathon training. And I apply a lot of marathon training principles um, when I train for the marathon ensemble. So, um so yes, I will do long runs, but I will do threshold runs. I will do um, intervals, so maybe six hundred meters to a mile. Yep. Um, there's yep. of course there's the backpack running, but I try not to overdo it. I prefer to run um, shorter runs with a backpack because it means I can keep my speed up and focus on, on good technique with a pack. Yeah. I think if you do very long runs, long slow runs with a backpack, and that's all you do, your 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 brain, your body is going to associate running with a backpack with running slowly. Yeah. Um, and yes, you need to slow down to pace yourself over the course of the week. But if you want to race it, you have to be able to still run fast with a pack. Um, yeah. So it's in terms advice. of mileage, I mean, I don't, I don't do as much mileage as many others. I think for the Mountain de Sable, I averaged about. 100 kilometers a week yep. um, for the three months leading up to the race. Like I say, from from December, yeah, December, January, February, it was about 100 kilometers a week. And then in March, I um, I lowered that. Um, it was almost an unintentional long taper because I got really, really busy with the business in March. Yep. Um, but yep. I focused on heat acclimation, um, maintaining speeds, um, and getting some sleep where I could. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. um, <laughs> yeah, a real busy life for the sales. Yeah, you know, just try to get to the start line feeling, feeling, you know, fresh and well rested. In fact, uh, that you had to probably cut back and have a longer taper probably did you good in the long run. Um, yeah. Yeah. Do you do a lot of um, cross training, strength training, mobility work, um, that sort of thing as well in your training, or do you concentrate more on the mileage? It's more running, um, mainly because I think I just I just struggle to fit it all in, to be yeah. honest. But yeah. I do um, I do a little bit of running specific strength work, um, stretches and um, drills. Yeah, and drills. So, so because you're yeah, obviously I a fast know. runner, so yeah, how big how big is technique to you? Is that really important? Running technique. Yeah, it's important. It's important. I think it's important to um, to run economically and to stay injury free. Um, and um, I recently did um, a full body three sixty degree gait analysis, which was really quite interesting because oh. I had a little hip niggle that sort of kind of kept flaring up 
when I up my knowledge and so I just wanted to get to the bottom of that. So that was really interesting, you know, and I think, um, uh, yeah, it's always good to get someone else to observe how you run because, you know, it's very difficult to, to look at yourself and see what you can improve. Absolutely, you know, yeah. It is. I mean, it's something that I neglected, well, because I sort of grew up with the sport, if you like, um, in my early years, uh, before I had any knowledge of what the heck I was doing, I just ran long, slow mileage. I never concentrated on technique, I never concentrated on speed or intervals. I sort of resigned to the fact that I wasn't fast, so why why train speed? And just ran long, uh, not knowing any better. And in the last few years, I've really, not that I've become a speed machine, because that's never going to happen, but um, I've been concentrating on technique massively and on strength the older I get the more I realize how important strength training is for injury prevention um, and it's made a huge difference you know the knowledge wasn't quite there so that speaking to an elite athlete someone at the top end of the game it's really interesting to me to see what sort of things you do specialize in and how big technique do you uh, subscribe to say like the pose running technique or chi running or anything like that what sort of technique work have you done you know like what sort of what, where do you get your gait analysis and things done so yeah that's interesting i i don't prescribe to any sort of you know particular um you know, name the running technique as such. Um, um, I think it should come fairly, you know, naturally. But what I did consciously, and this was, um, I'm trying to think how many years ago, maybe 15, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, I, I was a, uh, had a, a heel strike and yep. I, I decided to change that and so because I had um, a few knee problems um, so um, I, I just retrained myself to run more in my forefoot yep. I discovered that as I did that I got faster I didn't get any knee pain and so I just continued um, to do that and it's something I've done ever since um, as part of that I did a little bit of running um, barefoot completely barefoot just to um, really I guess get the lightness into my step and just understand what that felt like but yeah. now I sort of run with shoes all the time yeah um, but I, I, I like to think that I have sort of maintained some of that, that technique that I learned um, yeah. from making that decision um, and other than that you know I think it's um, you know, when I had the gait analysis done, this is a specialist clinic in the south of England, um, and yeah, they don't um, they don't prescribe any particular technique as such either. But you know, you just look at you know the angles of you know your knees and your elbows and your hip, and you know look at how your feet land and you know yeah. whether you um, cross over, which is the case with me, or things like that. You know, or if you have any bad habits. That, that sort of stand out. I think with running technique, to be honest, for me a lot of it is just common sense. Um, yep. That's that's how I look at it. Yeah, yeah. Um, now going into like you as a person, how did, what sort of a childhood did you have that you would become this amazing runner? You know, like were you a really sporty kid? Were you like, is it in your genes, in your family genes? Um, so I think there is um, an element of family genes. So my um, my grandfather was a um, very successful cross country skier, um, and he also founded Silva, the compass manufacturer. Oh. Um, my uncle was a yeah, he was a successful orienteer, so he did a lot of running and I've seen some photos of him running and he's got this amazing posture. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's, it's cool to look at. Um, I actually took part in some research uh, that someone did at the London Marathon um, last year and it turned out that I actually do have like an endurance gene. So I guess, oh. you know, in terms of running or, or any sport I'm more um, yeah, I'm a more of an endurance athlete, what um, which of... I can't even do anyway, because you know when you did like 60 meters in school, I was always last. <laughs> <laughs> how do, how um, do they test uh, for an endurance gene? Tell us about that research. How, what did that mean exactly? 
Um, well, it just means that you, it, you know they didn't give an awful lot of explanation, but it kind of means that you you or I do to do with your the composition of your of your muscles and the muscle fibers, and you know whether you are more geared towards being a kind of a an explosive athlete, um, you know, short distance runner, um, or whether you you know genetically um, you might be. Um, a better endurance runner, I suppose, if genetically, you know, you are um, uh, more of an endurance athlete, presumably um, you, you might be able to achieve more um, in that kind of running. Could they take by, a... by training less as well than someone who, you know, uh -huh. is a short distance runner. So, Did oh, they take blood tests for that? Because or... I can imagine like two people with different sort of... Sorry. Did they take blood tests for that, or or? Yeah, they, yeah, yeah, took blood tests. Oh, ah, very, very interesting. Uh, yeah, they probably um, held on to a lot more information than they could share with <laughs> with us as individuals. But yeah, it was very interesting to just to just know that. I guess it gives a little bit of sort of um, reassurance somehow, or you know, you know that maybe you've chosen the right line of sports. Sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're in the, you're in the right game. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, when I grew up, I did a lot of um, um, skiing. So I grew up in Sweden, so I did cross country skiing in the winter. I did long distance ice skating on the lakes. Wow. I was out um, walking a lot because my dad was um, a very passionate bird watcher. So he would take the whole family out weekends, and then we would just walk around, you know, uh, watching birds, which I'm not interested in. But <laughs> yeah, I was just. Uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time outdoors and I did um, kayaking for a few years as well. So that connection to nature is... Just seems, jumping. Yeah, like being being connected to nature and being outside as a child seems to have a lot of correlation to later on being uh, drawn to the wilderness and drawn to, you know, pushing your limits in the wilderness. What's your take on, like, the way the world is now with technology and the kids not really or a lot of kids not getting that exposure to the to, to Mother Nature, if you like. Oh, God, don't, don't get me started on this topic. Yes, please do. <laughs> uh, I, find it, I find it really upsetting and, you know, um, also looking at, you know, a country like the UK where, you know, child obesity is a massive problem. Um, I think it's shocking, you know, I, I really do. And um, but it's this cultural shift and... Um, there seems to be a lack of a lack of awareness, but also you know a lack of suitable environments for people to be outside. You know, when I was when I grew up in Sweden, you know, we I I cycled everywhere. My parents didn't drive me anywhere. You know, I cycled to school. I cycled to my activities after school. Um, and I could do that safely because there were cycle lanes everywhere. Um, in the UK, it's probably quite difficult to you know. Put the child on a bike and you know expect that they get home again safely. Yeah, but, in one place. Um, I think society is kind of not really geared up to support um, maybe more of an active lifestyle. Um, but parents have a massive responsibility. What sort of consequences do you see in a, for the social side of you know the the implications of that for the next generation? The fact that you and I both grew up you know, constantly outdoors, running around in, in nature, never in front of a screen, and you know, unless it was at nine at night, just before bed or something. Uh, you know, that sort of an upbringing has definitely influenced who I've become and what was expected of me. And I see this next generation having a lot of social problems and, um, you know, for everything from drug abuse to alcohol abuse to... Uh, obesity to yeah, lots of sedentary life diseases. You know, it's one of my pet, pet uh, research subjects. Really, is 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 looking at how this is influenced, and I really think that this disconnect with nature is really going to have a massive impact in the future. Do you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, you know. Be behavioural issues and children definitely connected to, you know, poor um, poor diet and, you know, lack of exercise. Um, you know, in the UK, the National Health Service is, you know, collapsing, um, but, you know, more and more people are going to need it, um, but unnecessarily because they are going to get a whole host of lifestyle diseases. Um, and um, 
Yeah. It's, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe we're not as crazy as it seems then, because, you know, one of the constant comments you get as an ultramarathon runner is, you're nuts, why would you do that? And it's crazy, and you've got to wreck your joints. What's your, what's your opinion on all that? I think, um, you know, you have a body and use it or lose it. That's the way I look at it, you know. Some real um, simple words of wisdom I there, right? Eh? Yeah, I really agree. I think, you know, our bodies are made to move, aren't they? Yeah, I, I definitely think we were made to move. We were not made to sit on a chair all day, you know, staring at the screen and... Um, yeah, unfortunately we do, and it's, it's having um, it's having implications. But yeah, you need you need to do what you can to use to use your body. You know that's that's what it's for. Yeah, and we're not you're going to wreck our joints. You're not going to end up with stuffed hips and knees and stuff because you're running. No, you're not. But I guess here the, the problem here is that you know, like you and I, we grew up being active, so. Our um, bones and, and muscles and joints, you know, they were, you know, prepared in the early years. You know, you start to build that strength. But if you don't do that as a child, and then, you know, all of a sudden you start running or, or doing any sport, you know, you probably will get problems. You know, it's, you have to. I think if you if you want to take up sport and maybe particularly running, which is high impact, um, you if you don't have a sporting background, you you have to do it very carefully and very gradually. You know, I think you do need to get advice from, um, you know, a sensible coach because there is always this temptation to do too much too soon. I think you know people say, "Oh, I'm just gonna, you know, I need to lose some weight, and you know, I'm gonna start running now four times a week." And if you haven't done anything before, yes, you, you will get problems. Yeah. Um, that's some really good advice, I think, actually. It's, it's just taking it a step at a time and not expecting too much. Um, yeah. And, and, but, and, yeah, if you haven't got that background, yeah. it's going to take a year but or it, two. Well, really, uh, I, I find sort of frustrating sometimes is, you know, when I have to go and get, like, going back to kind of the whole um, health issues, like, you know, when I have to go and get, like, a medical certificate for a race or something, yep. you know, you go to the doctors and... Firstly, you don't have time to see you because you're actually not ill. But if they do have time to see you, they take your heart rate and, and blood pressure and things, and then they think you're abnormal because, you know, your resting heart rate is low. Um, you know, and then you get all sorts of, of difficult questions and, and problems because of that. You know, it's it's like being healthy is not normal anymore yeah. because what's normal is based on what's what's you know the average in society. But society is ill. It's sick. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. That is so. That is so poignant. Actually, that's where you have to try and find a doctor who's an athlete himself or herself. That's what I've done. Yeah, that's what I've done. <laughs> Me too. Because otherwise, they just oh, as soon as you get a little niggle in the knee, oh, running's bad for you. You have to quit. You know. Um, yeah. Gosh, if I'd had a dollar for every doctor that had told one of my athletes or myself not, you know, to stop running, um, you know, I've got a, a friend in the states, Molly Sheridan, who's this amazing woman. And she didn't start running until she was 48, and um, she got a stress fracture in their first year. And she went to the doctor, and he just said, oh, you're too old to run, you know, and you, what are you doing, you know, trying to run for this, train for this marathon? Well, she went home so peeved off at him that she ended up, like, you know, really taking up running big time after her stress fracture had healed, and now she's done, like, I don't know, 50 or so, 100 milers, and... Um, you know, lots of 200k races and bad water five times and God knows what, you know. So stick that up, you jumpy, you stupid doctor, you know. <laughs> sometimes, sometimes maybe that's what you need to hear. You know, it works for some people to say, you know, you, you, you know, you shouldn't be doing this, you can't do this. Well, you know, maybe, you know, some people thrive on that. And, I mean, isn't that what happened to you? Right? Yep. You, you hurt your back and... Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, I was told I'd never run again, and, you know, 70,000 k's later, <laughs> I'm still going. <laughs> and... And the doctors even now, like, you know, I'm 47 and I go to the doctor and they're like, wow, you know, this is all great and that's all great. And you've got actually, you know, I've got a bad back because of the accident, obviously. But even that is better off because I'm strong, my core is strong, I keep myself mobile, I do a lot of exercises and, you know, rehabilitative exercises and corrective stretching and things like that. And I am better off 
because if I if I hadn't ever done any of this, if I'd taken the advice of the doctor 25 years ago, I would have ended up hugely overweight because I love eating. And um, <laughs> it was one of the reasons I, I run. <laughs> I love eating. Yeah. Um, I, you know, and I would no doubt be not half. Well, I'd probably be twice the size I am now, and be a whole lot worse off. I'm, I'm sure of it. I'm absolutely sure of it. Um, yeah. So you know, even though it's a it's a battle with the with the back, and I have a you know fair amount of pain, I think it's better to push through sometimes and and deal with a certain amount of pain um, and to wear out rather than to rust out and become hugely overweight or or any of those other horrible things that happen to you because of it. Um, so yeah. medical advice, yes, follow medical advice, but um, take it with a teaspoon of common sense. <laughs> <laughs> Which doctors sometimes seem to, I'm going to get shot for saying this, seem to be missing that gene. Uh, <laughs> some doctors. But um, what do you think about what uh, What sort of uh, diet do you have? Do you just like, you know, you, you run so much you can eat anything type person? Like, uh, you know, or are you, you know, try to, to do a certain way of eating or diet? Um, I... I believe in eating, you know, like a healthy, balanced diet. So I try to avoid processed foods. Um, I eat a lot of um, salad, vegetables, fruits, fresh fish, fresh meat. Um, I hardly ever eat like frozen foods or anything processed. Um, I will have ready meals um, on a regular basis because of my lifestyle, which is quite busy. Yeah. Um, but I try to make good choices. Um, I love red wine. So <laughs> <fair amount. laughs> Obviously um, it hasn't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I think generally I eat quite healthily. And yeah, I just try to, to, to eat balanced. There's, you know, there's not anything that I will go like, oh, I will not eat that, you know. Um, I think if you're using your restricted diet too much, it can become quite complicated. Yes, um, as a person and as a, as a guest. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, I think, you know, I think if I, if I did have more time, I would, you know, cook more from scratch and maybe I, I you know, would... Um, change a few things, but generally speaking, it's it's pretty good, and I kind of eat um, pretty much what I want, basically. And you're so super slim, so you're obviously doing something right. <laughs> I mean, to be honest, I could, you know, I could probably weigh a bit less, and I would be faster, particularly over a marathon distance. But I think for um, the multi-stage races, it doesn't hurt to have a little bit of, you know, extra fat on the body, and you need. You need to be strong um, yes. as well when you carry a back and that. So um, I think it's about striking a balance, really. Yeah, actually, that's a really good point. You know, often, you know, I'll do an interview with a journalist or something and they go, oh, you're not skinny. You know, you're not, you know, you know I take great offence to that immediately. But anyway, I sort of, <laughs> uh, I think what they're meaning is that I'm not a scrawny 35 kilo person, you know, I'm a normal weight and, 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 um, rather, you know, athletically built. Um, there is a difference yeah. between the ultra marathoner and the marathon, you know, elite runner, and an elite ultra marathon runner. Um, we are more tend to be slightly more muscular, quite often. You know, gen generalising here, shorter builds, more muscular. They're not. We're not waifs. We don't need to be waifs because we need to be able to carry a little bit of carry a backpack for starters um, would that be your experience too of, from the ladies that are out there or the people that are out there yeah I would, I would say so um, I mean I think if you want to run really really fast and in a race where you don't have to carry a backpack and sort of survive then you can probably benefit from, from less body fat um, but yeah and I think we're also you know all of us are individuals as well so I think it's very difficult to specify a certain you know number in terms of body fat percentage or anything like that because you always have to look at the individual and you know what's right for that um, generally speaking I think some people coming into 
to running um, or maybe coming into running do that because they want to lose weight in the first place. Um, and, you know, I know that there are coaches out there who would like promote weight loss. Um, and I, you know, I think you first of all, you have to focus on performance. And if you focus on performance and, you know, you're healthy and you're strong and, and you have energy to train, then your body composition will change as you progress. That, that's, that's a really good piece of advice. Focus on your performance rather than on the weight loss or, yeah, in specific. Cause a lot, do you get a lot of clients, you know, your, your coaching clients coming to you who want to lose weight and think that running is the best way to do that when... In actual um, fact, it's probably not the most efficient. Uh, yeah, I mean, there is an element of wanting to lose weight for some people, but um, I think people don't come to me because they want to lose weight as the primary goal. You know, they, they want to achieve something in a race. Um, and then um, some are a bit obsessed by weight, but I actually, I take that out of the equation completely. I, you know, because when they start with a structured training program and they start to progress through that, you know, they train more than they've done before, um, they need to have the energy to do that. They actually will see their performance improve. Um, and of course, you know, if they have a really bad diet, um, <laughs> I, I, we will talk about that. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But generally uh, you focus more on getting them fit and strong and the weight loss will come with that, sort of, that yeah. will automatically sort of happen. Yeah, I would rather look at it that way, also because I think it can be quite stressful to focus on losing weight. Um, you know, we have enough, we have enough to deal with in our lives. You know, with work, <laughs> family, and you know, and then you start, you know, you need to fit training in, and then, you know, probably the last thing you need to do is get obsessed about, you know, calories and yes. and everything, but. Um, you know, you can still make healthy choices, but you can do that in a in a way, you know, where you apply some common sense. And, um, and at the end of the day, if you don't eat well and if you don't eat enough, you're not going to have the energy to actually do your training sessions, and then you're not going to get the benefit. You know? Yeah, um, I mean, it's perfectly possible to go out for a long slow run on you know, not having eaten for a week because you will mainly burn fat you know but if you're going to go out and do a high intensity session for an hour and a half two hours you need to you, you need, need food to <laughs> you. <laughs> you need some fuel <laughs> yeah no I think that's really good advice um, now let's get on to a little bit your your husband is also a great runner Colin tell us about him yeah, yeah we um we actually kind of started, well, I say started running is, is not right because we had both been running before we met, but we sort of picked up running together um, again, I suppose, when we met um, and we started to do ultra runs together. So, um, so that's been really good, actually, because I think ultra running is a sport that demands a lot of you and it's difficult to do it if your partner is not supportive. Very, and it can um, lead to divorces and all sorts. Of <laughs> the amount of time you're out on the, on the trails, eh? <laughs> um, so having that support is great. Um, Colin is, uh, is really tough mentally. He spent, um, he spent 12 years in the military. Wow. Um, yeah. And uh, he... Um, yeah, he he just has this mindset where he will you know he will never quit anything, and he's incredibly strong. And he he likes to do more like really long non-stop races. He's he's good at that. Um, I think I'm better at slightly shorter distances um, and kind of multi-stage. Yeah. Um, so we seem to be forming kind of our different niches there. But he's also um, he's also older than me, um, so. He, 48 and um, I think when you get older maybe you actually get better at the really long stuff where you know you don't have the same speed as maybe you used to but you can just keep going and keep going sort of yeah thing, so. yeah yeah <laughs> I can attest to that <laughs> That's, I've got, I'm, I'm trying to convince Colin he's got to come down and do my Northburn 100 miler <laughs> and, you, 
Um, so, because I think that would, that would suit him to a T by the sounds of it. It's just bloody horrendously long and arduous. <laughs> um, and you're heading down uh, soon or next year to do the uh, Big Red Run in Australia. Yeah, yeah, I'm really excited about that. Yeah, it's going to be amazing. Have you have you done that? I've done it, but I didn't finish it. <laughs> uh, one, one of my... Um, one of my uh, did not finish uh, disasters. Yeah, <laughs> um, I had. Oh yeah, had some, you know, major stuff going on at home. Basically, okay. I mean, I wasn't in the mental space to to cope. And you know what it's like when you're in a, a race like that. You have to be on the on your game mentally. And it was one of those times where yeah, I yeah. had some major uh, issues going on at home. So I wasn't. So um, consequently, I had some unfinished business there, but um, it's a very well-run race, very organised by a friend of mine, uh, Adrian Bailey, and um, yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. It's probably not as spectacular uh, as, say, the Marathon de Sables, desert-wise, um, but, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a great sort of a family-sized race, too. It's not, not you know, uh, it's a bit more boutique in size and uh, a very different experience to the marathon to so I'm sure you'll you'll I'm sure you'll win it. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, well we we'll see about that but uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, go, actually you could probably go and kick the guys' asses too and win the whole thing outright just for the bit of luck. <laughs> uh, that's a good that's a good challenge. Yeah, that would be really good. The the year yeah. I did it it was won by a, a girl, so you know <laughs> small challenge there too, Elizabeth. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Make an uh, must win outright. <laughs> you must win outright, Lisa said. <laughs> One for the sisterhood, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, speaking of sisterhood, camaraderie, do you find the people that are doing this sport, which I've found, you know, like the camaraderie that you get out, out on these races, you know, the competition is always secondary to the experience and the surviving and, and, the, and the camaraderie that you develop? Yeah, I do, I do think, generally speaking, yes, I would say so. Um, I certainly always, you know, try to be, you know, very friendly and, you know, just really enjoy the company of others and just, you know, chat to people and learn from others. And, um, you know, when you're, when you're racing, you're racing, but when you know, you're not, when you're in camp or whatever, you know, I, I would just forget about the fact that it's a race and just, you know, try to enjoy it as much as possible. And I find yeah. uh, often, you know, like, people will even sacrifice their times and their, you know, their placing uh, in order to help someone who's in trouble or, you know, physically ill or, or struggling. Um, the amount of times that I've been helped or I've helped other people through, uh, you know, there have been times in races where, you can't even speak the same language, but you know, you know, a pat on the shoulder and you know, keep going and yeah, we'll be right. And you're running alongside each other for a couple of hours. Can't see. I remember once I was running in uh, Sahara next to a lady from uh, South America somewhere, and she was just gabbling along in her language, and I was gabbling along in mine, and we were just like, you know, <laughs> holding hands at one stage when we were got a bit desperate. We, we couldn't understand each other, but that language of that international language of like, we're in the shit together here. <laughs> yeah. Come on, keep going, you know, that much we understood, you know, and it was, it was really quite funny. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't know her name. Not uh, I don't know where she even came from or what language she was speaking, but we were r running along, holding hands at one stage when we were a bit frightened, you know. Uh, that's really cool. <laughs> you know, when we got lost, and didn't know where to go. So sometimes you don't even need to speak. You know, I, was, I remember um, I was running alongside a Frenchman for a while in a French race, and um, he didn't speak in English and you know although I studied French at school it's really really bad so <laughs> yeah it was, <laughs> it was quite difficult to, to communicate but just actually just running alongside each other and having that you know support um, was, was good at that point so yeah, yeah. That definitely yeah have times where you help each other um, now let's get on to your business interest because you've made a life out of your passion basically how's that going <laughs> <laughs> it's going well. Uh, it's hard work. Um, 
but yeah, we're really passionate about it, and um, yeah, it's it's going well. So we're really we're really happy, and yeah, just keep working hard, I guess. So you and, <laughs> and Colin are both involved with MyRaceKit.com. Yeah. So um, so we've had the company for uh, just over two years now. Um, we actually um, bought it from. Um, a couple that we got to know when we ran the Marathon de Sable the first time, and then they um, they contacted us um, because they wanted to um, yeah move on to do other things, and so um, we took over the company and um, uh, yeah we refreshed the brand and uh, we opened a physical shop, which you know at this time was only online. Ah, uh, I didn't know that. It's, and um, cool. and we increase, you know, we have we just keep um, taking on new brands and and increasing the the range and uh, um, we yeah we're one of the kind of niche ultra running shops um, in the UK but we um, we have a big international customer base as well um, we we ship to all over the world and sometimes we get people come to see us. Um, from very remote places, you know, especially people who might be doing business trips to London, you know, they take the time to come out and visit us, and um, that's fantastic. It's really interesting to get all these people, you know, coming to the shop, and we love it. And we, um, you know, we give a lot of personal advice, so um, people will come to us, particularly for multi-stage races like the Marathon de Sable, and you know, you can come into the shop and spend a few hours with us, and. Um, yeah, we, we you know we you just out. help you yeah. with everything you need basically, and you can come into us. You can get everything you need from a stage race, you know, from underwear to backpack to your food, everything. In shoes, one place, you we, can yeah. Walk out fully equipped. That's phenomenal um, so that's because you know I've got a lot of uh, people who will be listening, um, especially in the podcast scene, who are runners and who want to do multi-day stage racing. And, uh, you know, I've been looking at different shops over the years. Um, and what, when uh, I approached Colin, actually, and how, how we met sort of thing, um, I'd heard great things about MyRaceKit.com and, and the service and the products that you had there because my fiancé's just come back from the Grand to Grand. And it was apparently the talk of the, the camp there is where a lot of people got their gear. And... It was the go-to, and I didn't actually know of your website before that. Um, so, and, and you know, uh, being a coach and being, you know, uh, writing a book on the subject, I wanted to um, find out who is the best provider and the personal service. You know, like I'd written to a couple of other such websites um, and yeah. either got no response or got, oh, we just let people do what they want. They, you know. I got one sort of really weird response from a guy, yeah, I don't back anything, you know, just buy what you want. And I thought, well, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> How am I meant to know as a non-knowing person, you know, doing my first multi-day stage race, what the hell do I buy, you know? Um, yeah. So that was really refreshing. So everybody out there in runner world, um, go to www.myracekit.com and Elizabeth and Colin will sort you out with everything from top to toe if you're doing a multi-day stage race. It's certainly going to be my go-to place for, for my athletes. Um, and you can get everything in one place because it is a mission, you know, like um, with my fiancé, Hazley, going over to the race. We spent, you know, six, seven months piecing pieces together from all around the world to get his kit and get, a, you know, some good, good equipment. Um, we found you guys a bit late, but um, next time. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think that your, uh, you know, your business uh, skills have been helped by your running skills? You know, the things that you've learned. I mean, apart from the fact that it's obviously the equipment that is for running, but you know, what skills? There's often a lot of transferable skills I find between running and business. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I do have a background in management consultancy, so um, I also have a, um, um, like an MD, MBA in, um, in change management. Oh, wow. And, and uh, I'm sort of, um, um, yeah, done a lot of, of business management consulting and, um, and then, yeah, and then the running. And I, I think 
running this company, um, it all sort of comes together in a really nice way um, because, um, well, there's the, um, you know, you need to have the, you need to have the passion for running, you need to have the passion for the kit and the expertise about, you know, every piece of kit that you sell. Then you need to have a passion for people and for really, really good client service and that's what, you know, we really try to do. Um, because there's so many, you know, there's so many shops out there and you can buy, you know, a lot of stuff online, um, but, you know, it's difficult to get the advice and, and to get the personalised service. And that's really how we try to differentiate ourselves, you know, yeah. by, by offering that. Um, and then, I mean, other than that, I think, you know, a start up and running a small business you know you have to be incredibly resilient it's really hard work and um, I think um, uh, you, you get that from <laughs> from the ultra marathon running for sure um, so you know <laughs> it's probably transferable both ways but you know I just think it's the you know the never give up mentality you know positive thinking um, and just you know this relentless forward progress like all the time and um you can never do enough. There's always something to do, um, and you always feel like you're not doing enough. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not the only one. <laughs> um, so, and I guess you know that sometimes you just want to give up, but for some reason you keep going, and, and you know, getting good feedback from customers and that certainly helps. You know, it makes you feel like yeah, there is a purpose to this. You know. Um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, but following, I think following your passion is never easy. No, you know, there are easier routes. There are, especially if you've got a, interesting. an MBA and you could have stayed in the corporate world and you know probably made more money and um, you know, but at the cost of what? You know, following your passion and following your what you really want to be doing with your life, even though it is a hard road. I mean, I'm doing the same thing. Um, and you do, there was, yeah. a, you know, the, just those pieces of advice there, relentless forward progress, persistence, resilience, um, being able to live with the fact that you're never actually going to be quite finished, you know, you don't ever get that, uh, what I find being self-employed, um, you never get that feeling like you've done enough, you've got to be an expert at everything, because you yeah. haven't got the money to pay for the marketing person or the PR person or the... Exactly. <laughs> you, yeah, wear, yeah. you wear a hundred hats per day and you're trying to always go the extra mile for every single person. And it really is a, a, a long, hard road. But obviously you and Colin are getting something right if some little person in New Zealand knows about you guys. <laughs> yeah, it's encouraging for sure. <laughs> yeah, and hopefully we can we can um, you know be a part of building that success and help 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 in that way. Um, but Elizabeth, it's been uh, you know we'll wind up the interview uh, pretty shortly. But you know, is there any last bits of advice, like perhaps for women out there who want to do something amazing with their life? So they're in their thirties, they're in their forties. They're executives, they're, they've got their career sorted, but they feel like there's something missing. And these are a lot of my customers right now, uh, my athletes. What sort of advice could you offer as a woman uh, who is doing it and doing it extremely well? What sort of words of wisdom can you give? Wow. No um, pressure. <laughs> just like that, put me on the spot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> As a role model for women. <laughs> I mean, I guess, um, I guess the first thing I think is, you know, um, these people probably have, you know, confidence in other parts of their lives, you know, maybe confidence in business or, you know, whatever it might be. I think it's um, um, bringing that confidence, you know, into something else. Like maybe they're less confident and, you know, they say if they want to take up a running the running, maybe doing something like the Marathon de Sable, which actually, you know, you said this was your entry point into ultra running. It was something that I can, I can honestly say, like changed my life. And I think um, it's a fantastic starting point doing something like that, you know. Um, but you know, just having the courage, you know, because it's perfectly achievable, you know. Um, it's just, you know, having the courage to to sign up for it and kickstart the process, you know. Um, but then, I think particularly women. 
um, you know, these days there's there's a lot of pressure to achieve a lot of things, you know. Um, we should have a successful career, and uh, maybe we have a family, you know. I, I don't have children, but, you know, a lot of my friends do, and, you know, then you need to, you know, be a successful, good Mother mom. And wife. Um, and, yeah. And, you know, how many roles can you play? And I think um, it's impossible to be to be perfect, to be good at everything. I think you have to decide um, where your priorities are, and it's fine for those priorities to change over time. So maybe if you want to do something more inspiring, take a you know take a step back from work. Um, and what does that mean? You know, it might mean that okay, you know, you're going to postpone a promotion. You know, you're not going to go to all these work drinks because actually you need to, you know, be training. Um, but it's, you know, making those decisions and being comfortable with that. And then, you know, knowing where you have your priorities. I think that's, that can be quite difficult. Yeah. I think that's... So I don't know if that makes, if that makes sense, but, you Absolutely, know. yeah. In, in, in valuing yourself and taking time out too, I think that's probably what you and I probably don't do um, and I'm sort of starting to realize more and more how important it is to have downtime as well <laughs> uh, because you are a lot of ladies like us who you know um, in the pursuit of excellence of everything uh, that they do to the point of collapse sometimes um, yeah. uh, and it, it is very hard to be so multi multi-skilled and, and in our day in our, in our world in our business world and as a small business owner you know you do have to wear so many hats men and women but you know so many hats and play so many roles and be good at everything all the time and 24 7 you're on the ball sort of thing and I think that could be a, a, a huge huge pressure you know that can lead us to, to break as well so it's trying to find balance between your sport your business life uh, and what you want to achieve you know, <clears throat> it is really a delicate balancing act at times. <laughs> Would you agree? Would you think it's a delicate sort of a, a line to walk sometimes? Type right walk? Oh, have, you lot, have I lost you? Uh, I think we've lost you, Elizabeth. So I just, I just hear you again, actually, but you broke up a bit. So oh, that's cool. Me? That's very cool. I was just saying, you know, it's a really hard tightrope to walk sometimes, being uh, brilliant at everything. <laughs> it is, yeah, it, it really is. And I think, um, you know, you, you can't, you know, and that's where you think you just have to make some choices and, um, yeah, maybe be good at, you know, a few things at a time <laughs> rather than everything at once. But, yeah, as you say, when you run your business, it's hard because you actually have to be pretty good at, at a lot of things. <laughs> yeah, to survive, just to survive, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's been Elizabeth Barnes on Pushing the Limits. Uh, thank you so much for your time today, Elizabeth. Um, we are watching and um, I can't wait to see what you do in your career as a runner and also in your business uh, with myracekit.com please everybody out there who needs kit go and check them out online and I'm sure if you've got a burning question Elizabeth and Colin would love to help you answer the questions that you need answered um, it's been a real privilege to have an hour of your time today Elizabeth thank you very much for being on the show it's been, it's been an honour Lisa thank you so much